thank you. Well, uh, good, morning. good morning, Joe. How are you? Good morning, Oka. I'm all right. How are you? I'm, well, it's, it's just gone lunchtime here, so we're okay. Well, wonderful. Excellent. What time zone are you in? I'm, I'm in Central European. I'm in, I'm in Spain at the moment. Oh, wonderful. Excellent. Well, so great. So just honored to meet you. Welcome, everyone, to Ask the Experts, we are Experts podcast. So truly grateful to have all of you tune in. And today I have a very special guest, Joe Foster. Joe is the co-founder of Reebok. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for the welcome, Elka. Nice to meet Let's you. Start. Nice to meet you too, Joe. Let's start with your first question. If you had to start all over again, what would you do? Would you do anything different? I, well, since uh, Jeff and myself, my brother, we started off in 1958. Since then, the technology in the world has moved so rapidly. So uh, what would I do? Uh, I, I think there's some basics. One thing is know your business very well. The other basic is no technology. You've got to understand technology now because technology plays such an important role. You know, we, we're talking on Zoom and uh, prior to COVID, we didn't have Zoom. Yes. We had computers, we, we, we could send messages, we had smartphones. But when Jeff and I started, we didn't have computers. We didn't have smartphones. In fact, I stepped back from Reebok in uh, 1989, and we still didn't have computers, and we didn't have smartphones. All those have come since. So if I was starting today, yes, I would research, because you can research more. You can do so much research now uh, with the uh, technology we have. So I would research everything that I needed to and uh, learn all I could about whatever whatever environment I was going to go into, I would yes. do that. But then, mm -hmm. as I say, there, there are some things which are, which I can go back to my grandfather. You have to find how do you influence your market. That is so important, to know how to influence your market. My grandfather probably didn't know the word influencer, but he used to provide his shoes to leading athletes. Uh, way, way back in 1904, he, he, had, uh, he had three world records in his shoes. 1908, he had gold medals at the Olympics, giving his shoes wow. to the right people. And it's that, know who influences your business. And in the 20s, uh, 1924, in fact, which is 100 years ago, that was the Paris Olympics in 1924. Two athletes, one won the 100 metres and the other 400 metres sprints, and they both wore my grandfather's shoes. Wow. And so we're, we're celebrating 100 years now this year of, of those victories. So, uh, and they were the athletes in Chariots of Fire. Amazing. Uh, remember, uh, they were the ones that were immortalised in Chariots of Fire. So... When we talk about what you need, you, you need to know what influences your business, how you can make people, get people's attention. And if it's a product with, uh, with sports shoes, it was quite, it was much easier with sports shoes than many uh, products because sports shoes have an identity. You, mm -hmm. you, you look at them and you can see, yes, that's an Adidas, that's a, an Ikea, that's a Reebok. And yes. you, you can see the product. So that is a help in the, uh, in street in street shoes, you can't have that, but you still you still put them on people who are, who are interesting and uh, and then then you promote it, then you advertise it. Absolutely. In our early days, in our early days, all it cost was a pair of shoes, mm -hmm. and my grandfather just a pair of shoes. Now, now influencing is a big business. Absolutely. Yes, it is. Um, so when we talk about influencing, what are some of the tips and insights that you could, you know, share with our audience uh, for business and leaders? What are some of the tips and insights? Tips and insights. Uh, I think I think it's very uh, it's very useful to find something which is 
unusual. If you can do something a little unusual, mm. and a lot of this is, is a bit of luck. We'll, we'll go to the 92, 1992 Olympics when Reebok had the, uh, the ceremony where, where you got your gold medals. Re Reebok had the clothing agreement there. So anybody going up to collect their medal had to wear the Reebok outfits. And right. Oh. These, are, these are the influencing ones. And in 1992, uh, the American basketball team won the gold medal. But of course, all these basketball players, they're all signed up to different uh, companies. And uh, Jordan, who was the team captain, and we all know of uh, Jordan, Mike Jordan, uh, he he didn't like wearing the Reebok tracksuit because he was a Nike man. So, oh. so he draped he draped the American flag over his shoulder to cover the Reebok uh -huh. uh, motive that sign. The uh, and uh, as soon as the ceremony was over. He took off his jacket and threw it away. But that caused so much attention. So wow. that gave more attention to Reebok. He, he wanted to sort of say, I'm Nike. But that gave Reebok so much attention. And, uh, and he actually signed that, uh, that Reebok uh, jacket. He signed it and one of, his, uh, one of his team took it. It's been sold. That jacket had been sold about two years ago for one wow. and a half million dollars. Wow. So these are the, the little things. If you can find some little bits of unusual things, right? people pick up on that, and that gives you a lot of promotion. So you, you, you look all the time to find something which is different. You know, and if you can find that little bit of difference, whatever it is, influences are good, but finding a little bit of something that's unusual is uh, – yeah, and, and looking for that, and, and it's uh, – but that does, it does help your product. Well, in essential, it's uh, what's your USP? How are you unique? How do you stand out? And in today's world, it's all about standing out as, um, you know, perfect. Reebok is a brand and it's all about standing out. So, Joe, what are some of the stress if you, as you are traveling all over the world, how do you deal with stress if you do? And the competition. <laughs> well, you know, I was in, yeah, I was in I was in Charlotte. It's about six months ago now, uh -huh. and uh, we had an event there. Then after the event, we went to a, a school, just uh -huh. a regular school, and we talked to the students there. And one of the questions that um, was asked that how did how did you and your brother handle the stress of setting up your own business? Right. Mm -hmm. And I, I could answer that quite easily because I said, we didn't know the word stress. Yes, true. Yeah. In 1958, we didn't know the word stress. stress. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one of the biggest problems in today's life is we know so much. Yeah. We know too much sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we have too many reasons for this, reasons for that. And so they give us too many reasons because... We, we can be ill without knowing it. We can do all sorts of things. And, and I think this, we, we go back to the, the 50s, we didn't know stress. Stress is something you put something on that when you, you're stretching a piece of leather, we get stress. That's but true, stress, yeah. It, it wasn't something that, that was an emotion that you had to, uh, that you suffered. So my answer is still that. that it, to me, we, we don't know. When we're not grown up with stress. So it's not a problem. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, you know, today we have, there's a lot of stress of new businesses or, uh, you know, people just start, just people just start wanting to know, okay, what is that next best or how do I start? And there's so much stress that we just inflict on ourselves. But back in those days, yes, people didn't have stress. So absolutely. And, um, if you could go back and share with the audience what are the three life lessons that you would want the audience to share? Could you share with us what are three life lessons? I think that we can take in away. Life lessons, integrity. You must mm -hmm. have integrity. Um, 
if you wish to be successful, you have to have that. Next thing, listen. Listen to people. It is so important to listen. If, if forever all you're doing is giving advice and not listening, you don't learn anything. You do not mm -hmm. learn. And there are so many people out there, some are a little bit shyer than others, some don't speak too much, but encourage that. Encourage people and share. Whatever your business is, make people feel they belong. They are part. And again, that was one of the easiest things for us with, with Reebok because we developed a winning culture. So everybody wanted to win. And you could, you could easily win because we had races. And in races, you win or you lose it. Yeah. Right. But in our races, we were always winners. You could beat yourself. You know, oh, this was my fastest time. This was, and I, I beat this person. I, get, mm -hmm. I, did, I was faster because there are hundreds, sometimes thousands of runners in some right. of the races. And so you will always be running at your level. You'll always know the people around you are all the same people. So if you beat them, you're a winner. So we could develop that winning uh, culture, which was part of the, uh, part of the company. And, and and everybody shared that. You know, you didn't you didn't work for Reebok. You were part of Reebok. You know, we're Reebok. So it's that we rather than um, I hated egos. I I didn't like it. people with an ego. No, no, we are a team. <laughs> we do this as a team. And right. uh, the only egos, you know, they they might be the influencers. Probably had egos, but uh, we use those people as, as influencers. Exactly. Well, there, there's no I in team. If That's you're building right. a team, you're building, right? If you're building a team, it's we. And oftentimes, you know, most people do uh, say, well, it's all about me. And that's where the ego comes in. And that's yeah. where, and if you're building a culture, which is why I really love, uh, Joe, that you have developed a culture. You developed not only a culture, but you it's a family. Reebok, the brand, is a family. And this is what I really love. And that's why it's really an honor for me to uh, meet with you because, you know, and I and I really love because it's all about the family and it's the culture. So it is so important. How can we develop a winning mindset? No matter what business, if you're wanting to start a business, how do you develop a winning mindset? Yeah, I, I think that is something, I don't say you're born with it, but I think you have to be an optimist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know pessimists and I know people who will ask questions and try to sort of nail everything down to the last detail. I think that's a waste of time, personally. Okay. Detail, you will find, but you've got to take the risk. You've got to make a move. You've got to do things. By the time you've got down to the last detail, it's probably too late. This yeah. is the risk, the risk with, well, come on. And so you develop that culture because everybody wants to be with you, taking that risk. It's that, you know, the gun goes off, you, you're going. Mm -hmm. Whatever direction it is that you're going into. Uh, we used to look for white space. And what is white space? White space for us was when Jeff and I left the family business and Adidas had come in and taken the soccer business, there was no room in soccer. So we had to look for different areas. For us, it was a rugby. Rugby in the north of England was a, a mm. specialist event. We had cross country. We had orienteering. We we had all sorts of running, fat running, and there were a lot of small areas that we could be number one in. We could be special in those areas. So we were winning all the time, and we were growing this culture. We had a small small factory in those early days. And a lot of the athletes would come along, would come to us at the factory and, and help. And if you needed a job doing, an electrical job doing, it was undoubtedly one of one of the people from any of the clubs would be an electrician and they would come and do it. And that built, that developed a broader culture, not just within the company, but within the uh, the sport that we were we were in. So... Developing that culture, listening to people, 
And a lot of those people did help us design shoes. You know, we had one called uh, Ten Detector because the back of the shoe, if it rubs the tendon, you get tendonitis and that is bad. So we had a shoe which we developed a dip in it so that it didn't touch the Achilles. And that's, that came through building this culture, building these people. They wanted to help and they wanted to help design because no matter how good you are, you, you do need people to help with the design. There are a lot of parts of the Reebok shoes, even today, that I designed. And they're still there. The classical is still there. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of things I didn't design. I, you needed that team. I don't know if uh, you know much about Reebok, but the pump, the pump was something, again, it was that uniqueness of the pump, that specialness. But that was part of the team. Somebody else brought that in. And, and okay. so it goes. So building that team, it's very important. And it's important that you share. You share that Yes, absolutely. Well, Joe, it's been such an honor, such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who come back tuning in to Ask the Experts podcast week in and week out. Stay tuned for the next episode of Ask the Experts. Joe, appreciate. Thank you so much. Been a pleasure, Alka. Absolute pleasure. And good luck with your business. Thank you so much. Thank you.